Hi everyone! So we're back with the sixth episode for the season and the last season for 2021 already. This week is someone quite remarkable and someone whose work I'm sure many of you already know. It is none other than the Australian and UK based flautist, curator, educator, arts producer, and fellow podcaster Tamara Kohler. Tamara has performed and premiered countless new works of new music for festivals all around the world, as well as commissioned work for ensembles and for her own performances and recitals around the world. And these festivals include everything from 8th Blackbird Creative Lab, Bang on a Can Festival and Darmstadt in Germany. She is the founding member and co-artistic director of contemporary ensemble Rubik's Collective, an ensemble whose mission is all about showcasing contemporary music from rising Australian and international artists. She is also a curatorial member of Coma in the UK, uh, which is quite amazing because all these ranges of experiences have combined her true passion for mentoring young artists, curating cross-art experiences, and her love for contemporary new music is boundless. So I can't wait to tap into a world of new music curation and education. Thank you so much for being here, Tamara. Oh, thanks so much, Vicky. I'm a big fan of your podcast, so this was a real honour to be asked to be involved. Amazing. Well, I suppose I'll, I'll just jump straight to it. Um, basically, I'm interested in starting out this conversation because you have such a diverse range of skills. Well, I suppose skills is the wrong word, but you have such a broad range of experiences from directorship to curation to performing and commissioning. So I'm kind of wondering how how that all took shape and how, how everything in your career has led to the point that you are at now. Sure. Look, my training started as um, a classical flute player. Um, I grew up, you know, like most kids playing piano and then started playing flute. And then um, somebody suggested that I audition to go to the Conservatorium High School in Sydney. And I had no idea what that was. And but I just thought, OK, look, I was really happy at the school I was at, which was um, had options for high school, too. And I, I, I wasn't very interested. And then, yeah, I was sort of just given this nudge and I thought, OK, look, I'll have a go. And um, I didn't get in at first. I, I didn't get in, actually, based on my flute playing, but um, I hadn't long been playing the flute, but I think I, I did okay in the sort of music theory side of things. And I think so they sort of said to me, look, um, w- we are interested in you, but um, would you like to play the oboe? Because I think they were down on oboe students at the time. And I said, well, oh, not really, not really. But um, I was just starting to get a little, do a little bit more with flute playing at the time. And I was changing teacher and I sort of said, um, my, my mum sort of said, look, would you be willing to give her another shot if she did another audition? And so then I ended up doing this other audition um, about a month later. And um, I think I think I made a pretty massive improvement in that month. So then they were kind enough to take me. And really, that's just where it all started. Like the Con High was an incredible school. It just, um, just opened a whole new world to me. And so it went from there. I was, you know, surrounded by excellent um you know other students who had the same passion and who many are still my friends and and it just set me up um and then also I was I did grow up in a in a fairly artistic family um most of my family were working in the arts um in the dance or the music music sector um so then I went on to do an undergrad in Melbourne starting with Marty McSully um doing an undergrad in flute performance um and and just having those first few chances actually a little bit in Con High too but those first few chances to curate recitals I just adored it like I just loved the idea of creating an event and creating experiences and thinking about how repertoire can inform um thoughts and choices and 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 so it just kind of went from there I had this love of just wanting to make something and do something with my music so I think the flute playing was the catalyst for for bigger creation and um and then my career has just followed that path that you know I'm doing all sorts of things now that but all of it is entirely influenced by the love my love of curation I think um yeah so I, I went on to um, do some private study in Europe and then went on to the Australian National Academy of Music in Melbourne um, and then beyond that I just I just immersed myself in festivals around the world and just just threw myself at it really. That's so cool and I love that you use the word curation rather than programming which is something I feel like we're beginning to hear that more and more regularly but I was reading some of the, the work that you had written or some interviews about you back in 2014 and 2015 you were already using curation to look at to look at music, which I feel like is a much more inclusive 
term to talk about how we invite audiences in and and how uh, musicians can create definitely I, I think I've always thought of it as an experience because I'm like I remember early experiences when I loved a concert it wasn't purely most of the time I don't think it wasn't purely just um the repertoire I was hearing it was you know this room and and I get this real obsession with watching reactions around me like my favorite thing is being in a a hall of like a thousand people and having silence and watching who can be at peace with it and who you know starts to struggle and and you know squirm and I I love that I really love watching kind of human reaction I'm a real people watcher I can't lie so I think I've always thought of it in a in a deeper way than just you know repertoire on a program Mm. But a weird question, which is when you were studying at the Con and then moving through international study as a flautist and, and a curator, um, did you ever have like a set of missions or a musical mission that you wanted to set out to achieve or express through your career? It's an interesting question. I I always had a love for for newer music, so music being written more recently, I always just found as a performer I connected with it more. Um, I mean, I still, you know, absolutely, you know, as a flute player and and playing a Brahms symphony was like a dream and still is absolutely wholesome to play. But I think I found connecting with newer music, it just just works better with me. And so I guess um, it started from there, but I always just wanted to make make experiences that were a bit of a journey that that you know I always thought about when I was thinking about repertoire in terms of different different experiences and trying to pull out a range of emotions or trying to make people um introduce people to something new or or give a different perspective to a concept or um I've always been interested in that you know um it even goes back to it's, it's so silly um but at the con high you know we had we had houses like every most schools do uh, sports sports houses and things but of course because we were a dorky music school our houses were Bach Beethoven and Brahms <laughs> which <laughs> so funny talking to people now who weren't in that bubble um and like from a youngst being a youngster in high school like I knew that I wanted to be captain of I was in Bach and I knew I wanted to be captain of Bach and the reason I wanted to be captain of Bach was because you got to curate this concert in year 12 um and like I was dreaming about curating that concert since I was in year eight you know and I was and and like literally to the embarrassing point where I had a little book where like (laughs) if I had a piece of music I'd like write it down you know or if I had an idea I'd write it down and so um, you know, luckily I was elected captain because that wasn't the sure thing. Um, I think I probably scared everyone into voting for me because I was so, so, so passionate about it in a really intense way. But um, I think even back then, even back then, I, I wanted to create this program that had this like, variety of experiences and sound worlds. And, um, yeah, I wouldn't say it was like now, now later on, you know, doing some, some bigger level curating, I think I do have a few more ideas about more, more more intentional concepts and things but it did always come from a real natural place of just wanting to create interest and and just um draw intrigue out of people do you still have that book <laughs> <laughs> do you know probably in a box in my mom's place somewhere <laughs> gonna find it you never know there are some hidden gems in there <laughs> it's true it's true I might have been well ahead of myself who knows <laughs> well when you say a variety of experiences do you mean with music as the central focus, but including other kind of interdisciplinary considerations. You mentioned the room, so maybe like even architectural space plus art or dance, etc. cetera. Mm, I think, I mean, that's definitely a massive part of my practice now. Um, look, I grew up in a family of, of dancers. Um, my brother was a professional dancer and a choreographer and my mum, you know, taught dance. And, and so I was, I was always, and I also danced until I was in my mid teens. So I was always um, even more than music surrounded by dance. And I think, you know, that dance aesthetic of, of, you know, like, like how you present yourself and just little things like thinking about how you do your reverences and, and things like that. Um, I was just, it was just part of my life for an early age. So I think I always had, a visual aesthetic to performing in my head like it was just for me it wasn't separate from music um again it was it was it was natural because it was just my that was my surroundings um 
and and my stepmom, you know, is an opera singer and opera is obviously so, so performative and it is so much about the visual as well um, in a performance setting, live performance setting. So I think, yeah, I was just surrounded by it. Certainly nowadays um, I love working in cross-art disciplines because I just think you can draw so much more meaning and, and create create just incredible interest. Um, but I think I think it's always been there on some level. Which I think is really cool because I also love the mixing of all the arts. And you're right because... I think what I've noticed in the last two years that's been more present in my experience or interaction with classical music or art music, I'm not entirely sure <laughs> what to label it as anymore. But listening to recordings or having a digital experience, you lose that entire bodily experience that, you know, people in the room or other people, like you mentioned before, looking at people's reaction, you lose that dimension of being part of a mass audience. And then I kind of lose my bodily connection to the instrumentalists that I'm watching and their their connection to their instruments and seeing the physicality of making music. Um, yeah, so it's interesting now that everything's starting to open up how we're going to balance the digital with the with the physical and absolutely, I'm- absolutely. I mean, I think you know it's no secret that that this sort of immediate society we live in has probably destroyed us a little bit in that way in that we we expect to be stimulated full time, you know, and if something you know. And I, I do wonder if that's destroyed listening to a really wonderful recording for some people. But I think a lot of people don't know how to just listen anymore. Um, and, and well, I, actually, it's something I'm, I'm playing with a little bit at the moment. You know, I, I hosted a listening party just two weeks ago um, as part of um, some of my work because I just thought it's a, I wanted to bring a group of people together who'd been working on audio, um, sort of an audio production course and doing different music production tracks. And, um, you know, the focus had solely been on the music and there were no video clips or anything. And, and so I tried to cur- curate this sort of um, really relaxed listening party where people just came together and, we you know, we had some food and we had some drinks, but we really just listened and chatted about tracks. And it was so pleasant. <laughs> Yeah, there's something about like, just being present in the in the practice of listening that I feel like I've I've lost as well in the last year. So I'm trying to cultivate that. You're right; it's really easy to slip into needing to be kind of stimulated all the time instead of being uh, actually present. Mm-hmm. How do people react to um, to the listening clubs? It was amazing, actually. You know, um, I was working with um, a bunch of participants from a mental health and wellbeing program that I that I um, direct. And um, there's all sorts of musical programs in there, but th- this one was particularly for we had some participants, um, you know, training in, in Logic Pro X software and um, Soundtrap software. So it, it was a mixture of some are training to pr- um, be producers on other artists' tracks. Some were training to just make their own electronic tracks. Um, some had been recording in the studio and it was a real mixed bag. But um, I was pretty nervous because... You know, I, I, I don't think anyone in that group had ever just been to an event just to listen without, you know, that live performance visual element. Um, and so I did sort of set it up, you know, talking about about how we listen and um, just, just you know, some really gentle prompts there. And I, it was really well received, actually. And I think as, as the event went on, you know, people got really much more confident about sort of you know, calling out what they heard in a track and, and giving some really beautiful, like, positive criticism. And, yeah, it, it actually turned out really beautifully. It's something I definitely want to do more of. Oh, wonderful. Are there going to be plans for, for more of these listening clubs? That's the plan. <laughs> we, yes. I will, I will definitely share the word when I when I think about how I can. I'd love to take it another step further, which um haven't really nutted out conceptually yet, but definitely, definitely something that to, to look out for. I will look out for that, definitely. <laughs> I suppose I should move on to ask about um, one of the, the projects, I want to call it project, ensembles that you founded and co-directed, and actually that's how I first came across you, which is Rubrics, um, and to see how your philosophy about cross-art and new music has kind of form- formed how you direct the group and run the different programs that you, you guys do. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Rubrics Collective is um, is a... Well, we were doing like, like you were saying labels before. Labels are so hard, and I, I often struggle. You'll hear me say all sorts of different things about Rubik's. I say art music ensemble sometimes. Sometimes I say contemporary chamber music ensemble because we do cross a few worlds there. And um, I really hate labels in that sense because I use one, and then I feel like I'm underselling another part of what we do. But um, Rubik's effectively. Um, 
we started in 2015. In fact, we just had our sixth birthday last week. Um, and um, the ensemble was co-founded with three um, three of my colleagues who we were all at the Australian National Academy of Music at the time. Um, so Kaylee Melville, who's a percussionist and she's um, the co-director with me of the ensemble. And then um, Jacob Abella, um, a pianist, and Gemma Neal, a cellist. And the, the four of us... Um, yeah, I mean, we, we had a couple other members sort of in those early days as well playing around with us. And it just started because we um, – a lot of us had been – had been um, introduced to some some of the um, bang on a can style music or the eighth blackbird kind of style music that was being commissioned in America, and um, we found it really groovy. Like it was kind of this like new music, a bit of a pop influence, a bit of a sort of like um, uh, minimalist influences, and and just we didn't feel like that music was happening much in Australia. So we kind of we kind of just thought let's bring it here a little bit more that's where it came from um and then we always had wacky plans of like how can we how can we you know make music even more exciting by adding a theatrical element or adding you know looking at cross art influence and how it can heighten an experience and I guess I guess it just went from there and um these days it, it you know six years on we're at a stage where we are pretty much um, 90% playing commissioned music by us. And I think it's it's a, become a really special part of what we do because we do want to make these sort of deeply personal artistic experiences. I mean, music is is at the heart of them all. We are all musicians, but we always love working with cross art collaborators who, you know, who can take that experience a step further. And gosh, 90%, that's like... Insane. I've never heard of any other ensemble, maybe except for Eighth Blackbird, who who just play pretty much works that they have commissioned. Yeah. How how did that how did that shape over time over the last six years? Because you had to you had to have time to build up that kind of scale of repertoire. Def, definitely. I mean, it, it's it's not easy, and we were we were lucky. A combination of um, having a lot of good friends who wanted to try stuff out in us. Um, you know, sound creators and composers, and and so there was an element of that. Um, and then um, Kaylee and I just worked really, really hard at grant writing, <laughs> to be honest. And um, we're permanently writing grants, as, as you know, anyone who's a freelancer or a, well, really working in any organisation, arts organisation, there's someone in there permanently writing a grant. And um, we just knew that that was really important. So we, we worked really hard at honing in on that skill. And that did open up um, additional commissioning opportunities for us. And then I guess... Um, I guess the other way we were able to do it is we sort of just um, all of us in the ensemble were really interested in in traveling the world and going to a whole lot of different festivals and meeting different musicians and um, and just exploring different practices in, in terms of musical styles and approaches across the world and, I, and it's led to just a lot of really great collaborations. Um, so I, I actually, you know many of our main collaborators now we met at festival international festivals and many of them don't necessarily live in Australia but those relationships have really fueled fueled how we've sort of developed our practice um and I think also just where well and then it was also by necessity I should add because um our core instrumentation flute cello piano percussion I think we had one work we found <laughs> that existed so it was also out of necessity oh I see did you also have to grapple with arrangements at the beginning definitely definitely and it's it's something I I I still we still do a little bit you know I often find a work that I think oh wouldn't that be great if it was right for us and and that's something you got to tread lightly with because some composers are right up for that and some you could deeply offend by asking so um you tread lightly with that one <laughs> that's good advice I'll keep that in mind <laughs> should I need an arrangement um so out of this then emerged the Pythia Prize which is something that I think is super important uh, for everyone. And you've supported so many amazing new works um, with these female and non-binary composers. Was that something that was in conversation at the beginning or something that kind of evolved because you knew that uh, the way that the direction that Rubik's was taking was very commissioned based? Yeah, I think um, from the get-go, we, you know, it was blatantly obvious the lack of representation of, of um female and gender diverse voices in in the music slash art scene um across the world really and so that was always at the back of our minds and then what actually triggered the pythia prize to be um launched was we we were programming a concert in um 
hope I get this date right, I think 2017, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it was a celebration of Meredith Monk's 70th birthday. So um, Meredith Monk was an artist that all of us in the ensemble would have just been deeply inspired by. And, you know, there's, there's an artist who... I, how do you put a label on Meredith Monk? She's a dancer and a composer and a singer and a, a like a writer and she's just an unbelievable beacon of you know creativity and um and we were we were planning this big celebration. Um, we're really lucky to have the Invenio singers, a really great vocal ensemble from Melbourne, join us for that for that program and um, it just got us thinking like you know how did she get to where she got to and, and thinking about the opportunities that she had and the importance of, of giving, um, of giving any voice really, but, you know, balancing out those, those, um, those kind of mis you know, lack, lack of representations. And so we thought, well, what if we would have a, a prize where, you know, we can help to do, you know, play our part in, in helping to, um, expose some voices that might not necessarily be heard and, so we decided to link that up with, with the concert. Um, we didn't really know what it was going to be at that point. We just thought we want to do a prize. And and um, and then, yeah, we, we, we've just closed. We're literally in the middle of adjudication for our fourth iteration of the prize. And it it's just been an incredible um, thing that's just sort of evolved. You know, our first our first winner of the prize was, was Samantha Wolf, um, who just had an absolute ball working with. And... Um, it was something that we decided as an ensemble we wanted like it was really really important to us that we we put as little sort of parameters in terms of development time frames as possible so we wanted to really just say like we are yours you know we are your test dummies we want to work together and and it was so nice because those early developments with Samantha were really just like get to know you you know I just like sat with her um, we just drank pots of tea and just got to know each other for the first three hours about you know I remember her coming to my house and we just that was such a crucial part of being able to create something together was just developing that relationship and um you know it's something we're all really passionate about in the ensemble. so we we've just made it really a part of our a part of our practice that we don't limit it with you know you've got two developments it's the one thing I mean you know what a dream if we could do that with every single work but it's obviously it's just not realistic we will have lives we will have to eat we you know but pithia we do really keep in a separate category and we really try to just allow total openness and total freedom in terms of what we can provide um for, for the creator for our first intermission is a work selected by Tamara. This is the work Don't Say a Word, composed by Anika Sokolovsky in 2017, as an active reflection and call for empowerment for the female voice and experience. Rubik's Collective gave it its Australian premiere in 2018. This recording that you are now listening to is performed by the US-based ensemble, A Blackbird. Oh, my God. 
I think that's really amazing the approach you've taken to development like actually understanding that there's time to to cultivate all these different musical voices in a space to in order to truly collaborate because just as an experience you know as a composer I that doesn't happen particularly often so often you either get a prize or a workshop or a position in a festival or something like that and you get two weeks and then you have to produce something at the end and there's very little input um and all my amazing experiences with working closely with musicians have been when there's been a lot of time where we get to know each other and and also so that the musicians feel like they actually have a say in the music that that's being written too I feel like that's quite important uh, otherwise I think many orchestral musicians may have an experience where they're just kind of handed a brand new piece you've got two rehearsals and that's it and that's their relationship with the music yeah you know I think that is something that holds back a lot of ensembles from commissioning as well um I I was really lucky to to speak at a conference in Dresden in Germany uh, earlier this year and it was um the organization was a German a German um amateur oh gosh I'm gonna get the title wrong German uh, it was an organization for amateur musicians basically so it was a whole lot of bodies um uh, of organizations that that do work with amateur musicians and I was presenting a talk on how to make new music more accessible and um a lot of people you know were sort of asking me you know about commissioning and saying oh well you know like what if it's an awful piece or you know and and, and this sort of thing of like well you know I set this deadline they hand me this piece of paper and you know it's, it's too hard or it's it's awful we don't like it or and um I spoke to them, you know, at length about the importance of relationship development and, you know, think about, like, think about friendships, think about, you, you know, your, your personal relationships. They take work and, um, it, and it, it, they need nurturing and they need care and you're entering into a relationship with someone on some level when you're commissioning something. If you're going to create something together, I mean, there are different ways to do it. Some people are happy to just set a deadline and have a finished product land in their lap. But I really think that in my experience the most the most interesting creative works or or the most rich works come out of a collaboration where you know you get to know each other it's a two-way street and you can really create something that you both feel you connect with that sounds fascinating and yeah I, I feel like I think the conversation is changing in terms of how we collaborate at least I think so. <laughs> Maybe I'm just overly positive, but I think it's changing. I think some orchestras are taking a different model than just setting a date and then having the orchestra play. Um, and I think that will make the actual performance feel less ostracised from new music. Yes, <clears throat> I, to I totally agree. And I think it's, you know, I understand the, the restraints in terms of finance and time and everything, but if we're going to do something, do it properly, you know. Um, has that, has all this uh, experience with Rubik's and then all your your talks at these conferences then influenced how you're now working in Coma in the UK? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so um, Contemporary Music for All or Coma as it's, um, as it's more well known as um, yeah, this organisation that is entirely about providing access to amateur musicians to contemporary music and um you know what what an incredible thing that this exists first of all I, I've I'm a newbie I've been only been with coma um for just over a year and um and I I saw a, a role advertised with the organization and I just thought what how does this exist and this is literally my two passions like you know contemporary art and uh, I've just found in the last few years by um you know, not by direct intention, but I just have moved more and more into community settings and to community work just by, I don't know, um, sheer love of sharing experience and also just my passion for making sure everybody has 
you know, has opportunity, has experience. And so to find that this organisation existed was just wild. Um, and it was, it was a funny thing. I sort of saw the job, the job um, ad and I just thought, that's my job. I just thought, like, I, I'm, I'm built for this job. Like, I just – and actually, in a way, it was the easiest interview I've ever done because it's just, like, I just – just felt it in my core that I, I just should be here. Um, so I was lucky enough to be offered the role. And, and then um, it was a different role, actually. I've actually stepped into a new role with the organisation. So we have a, a biannual festival um, every March or every second March and um, and they very kindly appointed me as the festival director so I'm, I'm working my way up to my first festival as director in March 2022 which um, will be quite an adventure and um, this festival it runs throughout the UK and throughout Europe so we host different events I think I think we're looking at about 25 plus events across three days in March that um, all across the UK and Europe um, so it's quite a feast of of all sorts of performances and workshops and talks and um yeah and and um you know and considering the world we're in now i'm trying to make um a lot of it hybrid and a lot of it available online so um it is worth checking out because we have some pretty cool projects in there that sounds like a massive festival to combine the uk and europe <laughs> Yeah, it's, we're very lucky that the way part of the way that Coma works because we are a charity and we're you know um, quite a small team. But the way it works is we have we're, we're really heavily relying on partnerships and we have partners all over the place and wonderful partners. So um, other arts orgs, you know, professional musicians, amateur music bodies, music education hubs, um, and. Uh, Coma's founder Chris Surety has just set up this really amazing culture where the idea is that you get involved with coma and you you sort of sort of take on the um you know un, you know that there, there is a period of sort of understanding why we're there and what we're about and then the idea is that you start to embed your collaborations with coma into your core core budgets as an organization you know what a wild thing but um and i have to admit when i first heard of that approach i thought wow how does that work but people do it because the work is really incredible like really valuable stuff um I guess that the most amazing thing that Coma does is we commission work that's um, in an open squad setting. So the idea is that if you are living in, you know, a rural town and you know um, there's a violin player and a bassoonist and, you know, someone owns a, a tin whistle, we've got repertoire that you'll be able to play and it's accessible. It's not, you know, we commission at a level where, um, you know, if you're an amateur player, most works are achievable. They're satisfying. They are of a high quality. It's something we, we take really seriously that, you know, they're not just sort of weak works. So they are high quality works, but that they're accessible. You you know, it doesn't matter about your instrumentation. And um, I think Home has commissioned over 300 works now in that, in that um, sort of structure. And then the catalogue, that's just what we've commissioned and then we have this catalogue where also we're, we're um, you know, we're finding works that fit that or we've been given works and the catalogue has 800 plus works now. It's, it's an incredible resource. My God, that's amazing. I often think that's the way forward now instead of having to have like set orchestral things or chamber orchestras or quartets. Like even, for example, Rubik's is not, as you were mentioning before, is not a traditional instrumentation and there's now there's this amazing resource. I'm definitely going to link that so that people can access yes. it. Yes, yes, and and um, I'm working very hard to even expand it at the moment. Um, I've got a new partnership. I don't think I can say too much about it yet, but um, effectively what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to launch a subcategory of that that is music that is more accessible to disabled musicians. So we're working quite a bit at the moment at looking at how we can adapt current works in the repertoire but also commission new work and start getting composers to think a little bit more about, you know, when they're writing works what kind of um, what kind of things they should be considering, what kind of adaptations, what kind of, you know, new methods they should be to try and start people working more with disabled musicians. That's amazing, actually. Because I honestly as a composer, there's no training for that at all. Yeah, you're just yeah, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to feel, you know, I'm I'm I um hopefully will have some training options in the next year. That's the plan to try and get that kind of that kind of movement happening. Okay, well, I, I may sign up, actually, yes. I mean, this is a complete aside, but in, in my arts practice, that is less less about classical art music and more about sound installation. I've been in the last year or so trying to figure out how to integrate accessibility f like features into it for hearing and vision impaired because, I mean, that's not my lived experience, so I don't know how to make works that are sound-based accessible to someone who, who simply cannot hear them. 
So I think this is incredible to work in an acoustic classical music art music realm to make that possible. absolutely well and that's where actually also partnerships become so so important because obviously that that's that's not my lived experience either um and so working with partnerships where we are really you know this is i can sit here and come up with ideas all day long but what good is that it's not you know I'm, I really see my role in this kind of work as a facilitator to try and, you know, just provide resources and opportunity to those who actually can speak truly to this kind of work and, and to those also who, you know, have a much better idea of what's actually worth investing in and feasible and, and all of that. I think now just like thinking backwards with all these resources that you're building in alternative and I think essential ways in how we present and, and make and commission music just thinking when I was a student I don't think I played any new music because it wasn't part of our curriculum for the standard AMEB in Australia it wasn't really at the con until we had to take specific kind of music history courses that tackled new music but generally I think I played mainly romantic repertoire which must be I think the majority of people's experiences when they encounter classical music. I, I think so and and you know I think, I think a lot of people just assume because I have immersed my life in new music, oh, she, you know, she must hate anything written before 1950. I mean, it's absolutely not true. Like, you know, you'll see me sobbing in symphonies easily. Um, Alpine Symphony is on in my house. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's probably my partner's influence, but it's constantly, I feel like Alpine Symphony is blaring in our house, you know, three times a week. Um, I am, my deep love of classical music came from growing up with those classics and I think... Um, Good new music, good musicians who who specialise in new music have incredible technical facilities that have come from a study of, of that, of, you know, rich Western classical music. And I think there's a real misconception there of a lot of people think, oh, you go into music, new music because you're not very good. It's actually, it's not true at all because to be able to master that next level of, of technique, you need a solid foundation. And um, I think it's really important. But no, my goodness, like... You know, without without Brahms and Bach and Strauss, um, I wouldn't love new music. You know, they absolutely whet my appetite and, and then I just found another path off that way. <laughs> I think it's all connected. I do find it funny that you're right, like you, you specialise in new music, like almost like it's a completely separate discipline within art music, whereas it's all entirely connected. And I'm increasingly now seeing concerts that are programmed with, you know, brand new pieces that of new music or new music that maybe 20 years ago people would have been hesitant to play uh, with works by Bach and Beethoven and Brahms. So I, I like that these dialogues are beginning to happen more regularly. Mm. Mm. Um, I was wondering, and I don't know how relevant this question is, if, if in all your experiences when you're programming for yourself for recitals, when you're working with Rubik's or when you're ensemble or if you're curating anything uh, through Coma, do quotas play a role in how programming is created I yes um on some level I think with with Rubik's yeah look, look I can't like yes they do but it, inclusivity is just um by way of practice by um just a lot of work I've done in the past by my own personal belief it's just it I don't think twice about it and so um it's just that important to me. So I actually find when I am programming, I don't have to be so hardcore with quotas because it's happening more naturally. Um, look, <laughs> sound terrible. I'm often just more interested in, um, you know, female <laughs> gender diverse voices. I'm personally just often more drawn to to their work. And so um, I don't have to be so hardcore with the quotas myself because I think I'm just drawn to that work more. In saying that, um, I think quotas are a useful tool to get people thinking about whether they're practising, whether they're really representing community within their work, Um the problem with quotas is that people tick a box and say, but I, I did that, you know, I programmed three females or I program, you know, for, you know, I, I, I commissioned, you know, a global majority composer and, and so I ticked that box. And that, that's where it really gets me because um, quotas are a starting point, but they're a starting point to get you thinking and get you considering and get you changing your ways. And I feel like um, it, it works beautifully for some and for others it's still a box-ticking exercise, which is 
which is frustrating. Um, and, you know, some colleagues and friends of mine have started acting on that um, and what refuse to go to certain concerts that have certain types of programming. And, um, you know, I respect it on some level because how else, how else do we bring change? And, um, you know, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of representation, in terms of, you know, different cultural identities and backgrounds and genders. And For our second intermission, is there another work selected by Tamara? And this one happens to be quite personal and is noted by Tamara as being the work that represents her love for contemporary music and sound worlds. She first heard the work performed in Australia as part of a contemporary dance performance that her brother choreographed and was surprised and astounded by how a piano could sound so weird and wonderful at the same time. This is Sonata No. 5 for Prepared Piano by John Cage, performed here by Boris Berman. Although I, I, maybe perhaps again, I'm being too hopeful. I do think it's changing. <laughs> At least I hope so, because we have, you know, organisations like COVID that exist um, that I actually didn't know about until I met you. <laughs> so I must admit, well, Coma is amazing in many ways. We have a lot of work to do too. You know, I would never sit here and say that we're, we're leading, you know, I think we lead the way in some elements. We have a lot of work to do in others. Um, but we always have a lot of work to do. Everyone does. You never get to a point where you've, well, you've um, nailed it, you know, <laughs> because it's not what it is. It's not what it is. We all should be constantly reassessing our practice and thinking and just, you know, thinking, am I being inclusive? Am I being representative? Um, it's, you know, you have to, as I said before, I, I, I really more than ever these days, except for when I'm on the stage performing, um, I guess that's slightly different, but I really see myself as a facilitator more, you know, a lot of work I do now, I see myself as setting something up for someone else. Um, that's really changed actually in the last two years. Um, the only time maybe that's not always the case is when I'm performing um, because when, you, when you're a performer, obviously it's slightly different. But then again, if I'm performing a work written by someone else, I am still delivering their message. I mean, you could argue it in that sense too. Do you think the the kind of programming world and the way that you know, concerts are being curated uh, is has, is different between your experiences running Rubik's in Australia and now now getting a, a more experience in the scene in the UK? I would say that there is excellent curation going on in both places, and there's work to be done in both places. I I couldn't say that I think mm, it's really tough comparing the UK and Australia because I mean like not to beat around the bush there's just a lot more money in the UK for the arts and I know that you know everyone in the UK will sit here and go we've got nothing I can't believe working here now for a year and um how long have I you know I'm on and off properly for a year and a half and I've been I've been working here on and off for a lot longer um there is that much more money here and I know but oh, there is that much more activity going on here as well so it does even out in that sense but 
I guess um, there are incredible artists and there are incredible organisations in both countries. Um, on some level, it comes down to resources. I see so much great work going on in Australia at the grassroots level that probably won't get higher than a grassroots level because it's so hard to to get the money to do it. And you can do a lot without money, but... Um, you know, this is um, Rubik's have really turned a corner in terms of an organisation in the last year and a half um, in terms of our ambition and in terms of our goals because we really got to a point where if we were going to go further with and and take those next artistic, um, you know, ambitions to the next level, we actually can't do it without money, you know, and we were, were pretty good at stretching stretching that budget and doing things on a shoestring and calling in favours and, and working 12-hour days to make it possible, but it's not sustainable. It's just not. Um, so it's not to be depressing, but, um, you know, this is this is the world we're in. And But, um, yeah, I would definitely say this, this, there's great activity going in both countries and I could definitely, I won't, but I could definitely call out organisations in both countries who need to pull their socks up. Yes, I have a feeling we probably know which ones they are <laughs> in both <laughs> places. <laughs> yes, you're right about the grassroots thing. That's why I'm seeing all this really cool innovation happening. These cool interdisciplinary experiences, both in the UK and Australia, have been from really small, up and coming, independently run companies that you know hardly get any funding, or maybe more than one season. Um, I hope that changes and we go to a more sustainable model where those groups can grow and we somehow balance the scale away from those massive organisations that, that take a lot. <laughs> I feel like I've given away too much now. Well, <laughs> I have, this might be a bit weird for you, but I'm going to read out your writing to you. But I thought I was doing this kind of deep dive research into to written works that you've done for Cut Common and, and various other publications. And there was one particular article you wrote in 2015 for Cut Common called The Concert Experience, Let's Blur the Lines. And kind of right at the end in the dialogue, you have a list of questions that I feel like I'm going to, I'm going to ask you the questions that you <laughs> that you've list. So I'll just, I'll just read the little paragraph to you and see what you think. Um, it starts off, why don't we create experiences rather than concerts and give audience members permission to perceive the art as they wish? Art itself is a medium with endless boundaries. So why do we place boundaries on our audiences? Why not offer current day audiences another way of experiencing a piece of music, whether it be with a different setting of a venue, a little poetry or a surprise interpretive dance. In the end, it's all theater. So let's blur the lines a little. So the reason why I'm reading it out is if there's anyone who's coming to read this article, like I did recently, or anyone who's thinking about these ideas, what advice would you give to these up and coming musicians, new music specialists and artists? Well, Think about why you are an artist and um, we're all, the, the, the arts is broad and there are many different types of artists and by nature of, of what you do, there is more freedom in some practices than other. Of course, if you're in an orchestra, you can't take um, the artistic liberties that you might take if you are a um, solo contemporary dancer, but there's always a way to push the barriers, push those boundaries in your practice. And I think it takes, it's it's about thinking about A, why you do it and then really looking at if you are, if you are pushing it to its fullest extent. Um, sorry, I'm being a bit vague there, but, you know, we get really caught up especially I mean, musicians get caught up in technical proficiency. and I mean, it's a given. It needs to be there. And you can't take those next steps without it. But then I just think, why are we doing this in the end? We're trying to, we're, we're trying to give people joy. We're trying to make people feel things. And I just think it's really interesting to step back and think, are you really, really achieving that? Are you doing that? You know, could you, and, and even in an orchestral setting, you know, like like the greatest orchestras in the world are just big chamber chamber bands who just, you know, just like vibe off each other and, and move together in the moment and surprise each other, you know, in concert. It's, you know, it's more possible than sometimes than others. But I think we should all constantly reassess why we're doing what we're doing and if we're really pushing it to the full extent. Because otherwise we could just go and do something else that'd probably be a lot less stressful and um, a lot less time consuming. <laughs> like earn you a lot more money, let's be honest. <laughs> yes. That's excellent. 
excellent advice and something that's a good reminder for me as well. Um, sometimes it's very easy to get bogged down, I don't know, in grant writing, for example, and forget that you need to push. And I put in a good word for grant writing too. I mean, gosh, I know it can be a real pain, but and I know I've got a lot of friends who like and, and colleagues who just – have these great ideas and I just think, oh, my gosh, if you just wrote a grant and you just, like, got a little bit of a little, even just, like, a tiny bit of cash for that, you could do such great things and they don't because they're all paranoid and they're all freaked out because it seems like this horribly frightening thing. It's just another practice. You just have to try. But the thing that's really great about grant writing is it can really help you to conceptualise what you're actually trying to do and it kind of actually, into what I just said, like, like it really helps you clear, you know, have ultimate clarity in what you're doing and how you'll do it. And I think that's a really positive part of grant writing that, um, you know, believe me, if I never had to write a grant again, I'd be happy about it. But I'm going to put in a good spin for grant writing because I feel like um, there are good things that come out of it. And, and I just, I try to just tell people I know who are scared of it, you know, there are pros. <laughs> Yes, I know even when it feels tiring because you're right, we're like permanently in a state of grant writing when you're a freelancer. But that realizing that you have to really clearly communicate what you want to do, how you want to do it, and how it will hopefully contribute to, to your discipline or to audiences is, is really important because I actually think without the what feels like hundreds of grants I've had to write over the last decade, I, I wouldn't be able to articulate my own practice or what I wish to develop in my practice as as clearly so um I've actually asked you all the questions so is there anything I've missed that you want to touch on no I think I think I think you've actually um they're really beautiful questions Vicky I appreciate it because it's made me think you know um it's really pulled me out of a bit of a tired slump and 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 you know it's the end of the year and and you kind of feel um like we're looking forward to a bit of time off but um it's actually been really nice to just have a chat and remember you know how great everything we do is wonderful <laughs> you've inspired me with uh, with all your thoughts and your wisdom about new music and, and audiences and cross curation so um, thank you so much i really appreciate it thank you so much for speaking thanks so much for inviting me <laughs> thank you thank you again it's been so amazing getting to speak with you and what a way to end this year's round of declassify uh, as mentioned earlier, all of the articles that Tamara has written, all of her, her work, as well as all the resources that you, that are available through Rubik's and Coma will be just down below for you to access. I would highly encourage for all of you to have a, have a look through what's available there and also to spread the word. Thank you very much to everyone who has listened this year, and I will catch you all for the second half of Declassify in 2022.